Module 7, Producing Macros for Other People. So far on our Visual Basic course, I've been teaching you the skills necessary to save time and automate things using Microsoft Excel. That means you can spend five minutes writing code to automate a task that would otherwise take half an hour. However, Excel macros can also be used extensively in complex spreadsheets for calculation, and in this case, it's very likely that the spreadsheet will evolve over time and that a number of different people will contribute to the code. Therefore, you want to make sure your code is accessible as possible to a user. So let's consider the calculator macro which we created in module 5. If you can remember this module, the macro had the following effect. If I type a 7 in as a first number, then column D will tell me what 7 add 5 is. Column E, 7 minus 5. Column F, 7 multiplied by 5. So I can work out what the macro does very simply by putting numbers in. However, I'm not really sure how I can change it and whether it will still work if I make changes. I can experiment, such as by putting numbers at the bottom of the table. But if I put numbers here, it doesn't do anything. Therefore, it makes more sense for me to come in and look at the code to work out what the macro does at present and what its limitations are, so I can develop it with total confidence. The complete macro looks something like this. So what should I be looking at? Well, the opening section is a series of definitions to tell us what columns we wish to process the data for. What we really want to do is to mark those lines as if to say, here are our definitions. They don't affect the functionality of the code, but they mean you can make changes flexibly. So very simply, let's write that. So I've written a little comment. If I click elsewhere, Visual Basic will be confused because it will attempt to interpret this as code. So what you can do is very simply put an apostrophe at the start of any line which constitutes a comment. You can put in any comments that you think would be useful to a user. Let's say macro starts when calculation sheet is changed. The only way that anything can happen is if this if statement is satisfied. That occurs if there are changes in the columns of the first two inputs and they are underneath the header row. You may notice that by choosing relevant variable names like header row, we don't even have to refer to the sheet in order to find out what header row is. We can see it's row 2 from the name in the corner. If we didn't have an idea where it was, we could go to insert, name, define, click on header row, and get Excel to show us. So we can expand our first comment to say calculations only performed where input columns change beyond header. So far, we haven't really learnt much which would be of use to a developer. What is crucial is commenting the limitations of your code. In our macro, we calculate additions, subtractions and multiplications for every row underneath our header until we find a blank space. More specifically, when there's a blank space in first number col. So we can add a comment, calculations only occur up to first blank input column 1. Just to finish things off, I'm going to note these three lines here are the ones concerned with addition, multiplication and subtraction. It may seem I've done relatively little to the sheet, but actually I'm about to save us a lot of time. Let's say we delete the contents of row 7 because we no longer need those values. We then continue to make changes to the sheet and our numbers recalculate in row 6. If I now make changes in row 8, we see that changes haven't been recalculated. Ideally, this would not be occurring, but now we've observed that 9 and 7 should have caused D8 to change to 16. We have to work out why it hasn't made that change. So now we'd go into our macro, and the first thing we'd want to look at would be comments left by the person who developed the macro originally. Immediately, we can see that there's been a limitation noted of a macro, which is that calculations only occur up to the first blank in input column 1. If we decide we don't like that condition and would rather have the first thousand rows of data analysed, then very simply we can delete that line of code and remove the comment as well. We should of course now put a new comment which says only 1000 rows of data analysed. Or we could put this at the top of the macro. It's up to you. 
Now if I reaffirm the change to the first number as 9, zeros appear where blanks have been added, subtracted or multiplied. I'm going to quickly write an if statement, which means those zeros don't get shown. I could talk you through the if statement I've just written, but instead it's almost as useful just for me to write a comment which tells you what it's all about. Simply the outputs are blank if either input is blank. All these three lines do is to leave blanks in columns D, E and F. However, if we didn't put the column in the code and you came to this fresh, you may have to think quite hard about what this statement was doing and perhaps run the macro to work out what it does. Now if we make changes in B8, we get the spreadsheet result that we want. There is one other thing that becomes the focus of many Excel Visual Basic courses. Throughout our macros we use variables such as first call, second call, sum call. Normally our variables are numbers. However I can demonstrate two variables which wouldn't be numbers. If we look I've added two lines of code. The first says today's date equals date. Date is taken from your Windows system and we can see by holding the cursor over it that today's date takes the form of a date. We can also see that first header is a text string that tells us what's in cells 2-2, which if we look is first number in cell B2. The reason I bring this up is if I was to try to add today's date and first header, I would get an error. And I would get an error because I wasn't trying to add two numbers. Therefore it is good coding practice to define variables at the start of your macro by what they are. So in this case today's date would be a date. First header would be a text string and first col would be a number which we'd normally call a generic variant. It is considered good coding practice to write the full list of variables used at the start of every macro. This also prevents people using the same variable twice. However, it is time consuming and in a macro like this where all variables refer very simply to column numbers or row numbers, it's unnecessary and perhaps it would be better to write a comment such as variables are all cell columns or rows. The final thing to note about writing macros for other people is that it's vitally important that you use good tabbing. If you don't tab your loops, the macro looks like this, and then it's very difficult for the eye to work out what's going on where. Bear in mind macros and if statements may be far longer and may even stretch beyond a single page. Therefore, always, always tab your code out.